Good evening. How are you? I wasn't available yesterday because Holly and I, we got back from Johns Hopkins and the test that came out fine, uh, too late and without any light, and we had to take care of the animals. So I'm here today, but I'm here standing and talking <laughs> because it's uh, there's pretty cold rain outside. And uh, I thought to try it, and I may do it alone, but uh, I can't do it with a phone and stuff like that. It just wouldn't work. So here I am. Uh, that's also a part of my uh, Jefferson weather report. The, uh, the stories that we could discuss, there are probably 10 or 20, but there are a couple of things that I think follow uh, a rhythm and a theme, if you will, of what we've talked about before. And I have joked with friends who share my views that if Trump is elected, we'll get the uh, adjoining cots at one of his camps. Now, this is not a joke because he has talked about an enemies list and so forth. But more to the point is an example of how he would treat immigrants. And there was a, a proposal when he was president, when Trump was president, to have camps for the deported. In other words, we would gather up, because he thought it made sense, using the military, gather up those who should be deported, put them on military bases, and then fly them out of the United States back to where they came from. Now, this is not original as dastardly and wrongheaded as it is. Eisenhower, who is a president who's received uh, better compliments than he deserves, he had a proposal and he called it Operation Wetback, and it was a similar proposal. And what we do about our borders and so forth is uh, an astonishing problem given that there are solutions. For instance, create more buildings, get more judges, get more investigators, you know, build up for those who can be here and use some of the modern techniques to decide who should be here or not. But Republicans and Democrats in this White House is no different. No one wants to settle that problem. We want that problem. And... Uh, even partial solutions, as was suggested in a bipartisan fashion in recent weeks, they don't want that either. They want this to go on. It's a campaign issue. They can raise money on it. And they're not always caring about what the outcome is because the unintended consequences of doing the chicanery to, with American uh, issues, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't always come back to them. It doesn't come back and hurt them in a way it should, should be. Now, we live in a world of lies, and the reason to mention uh, Trump's uh, camps for the deported is because in a second term, there's talk that he would do it as well. So it's not just a historical drive-by slander on Trump, although the defense is truth. It is that he would think to do it again. Um, there are a variety of ways in campaigns that there's puffery, uh, there's uh, material omissions, uh, there are lies, and there are conspiracies and ways to lie. Now, I happen to think that the uh, so-called laptop of uh, um, Biden's son is itself a, an example of dirty tricks, uh, and at a level that Nixon himself would not do. But the best one recently that we can point to, which is very dramatic for the scale at which it operated, is that there was a lying FBI informant who was handled by an FBI member, and his name was Smirnoff, and still is, of course. And he, had, he claimed to know of conversations between Burisma's executives and uh, that they somehow or other decided they had to hire Hunter uh, to protect them from an investigations. And the Republicans have insisted that it was true. Well, it's not so. It is a lie. It is a lie. And this fella, he was protected by the FBI. He was used by the FBI. He was kept confidential by the FBI. And he has since been indicted for all of his lies along the lines that the Russians cherished and celebrated and uh, were using as a basis for the impeachment of uh, Biden. So the Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, uh, attempt to raise money by getting rid of an investigation is all a story, an election year story. Now, as a guy who's done some investigations and observed others do investigations, one of my first questions is, who is his handler? 
How did his handler not know this for an extended period of time? How did he not know this? And how did anybody outside the investigation, namely the Republicans, get their hands on this? And don't we care that we've also confirmed that the source of this information was the Russians? So the Russians, as in 2015 and 16, when they helped Trump, appear to be helping Trump again against the principal opponent that he has. And if you remember back in the period, at least in 2016, we started talking about Hunter, that is the Republicans did, Trump did, because that was his ace in the hole. That was how he could attack the ethical conduct, the character of a good man versus this uh, crime wave that Trump is and represents and continues uh, to flourish in a nation that doesn't take the steps that it should to force people to account for what they do wrong as and when they do it. Now, presently, I'm concerned that this fella, Smirnoff, may get out of town, if you will, because he's been released on bail. And apparently he has a small fortune that could enable him to go elsewhere. And in the 37-page indictment that was filed the other day, if you look at it, you can see the pattern of lies he tells, which fits perfectly the pattern of impeachment exertions, unjustified, unsupported by real facts, that the Republicans want in this election year. So it is very possible that the latest motion by the government, by Weiss, who is the prosecutor against Hunter Biden, it's very possible Although Weiss did the right thing. He said, I want you to look at bail and I want you to uh, treat it differently than you have. I want you to treat it seriously. And apparently the court has turned a deaf ear to these entreaties. So don't be surprised if Smirnoff disappears. It's interesting how we claim to be so superior in our equal justice for all when we're nothing of the sort. Uh, neither you nor I nor any of my clients or any of the clients of those out there who in any way, shape, or form have anything to do with litigation. No, there are different ways different people get treated. Now, there's another uh, manifestation of Trump gone awry, but faithful to his, I don't want to say principles, but serving his maganuts and those across the nation who don't give a damn about anybody else but themselves. Alabama has, listed, has um, written a post-Dobbs decision. And at the heart of it is a religious view that may not infect our civil or criminal law. And here is the religious view. The religious view is that at the moment of conception, that is when a person is created. Okay, so how would that operate in the real world? The impossible to know moment when a sperm fecundates an ovum, that is a person. That's a religious view. Now, you're welcome to that view. It's a fantasy. It's a myth. It has no medical support of any, of, in any way. Yet, yet, evangelicals and others would treat that as a person. Now, this Alabama case goes one step further. And there are people mumbling about natural law supports this idea. Natural law is an invocation by uh, Thomas Aquinas and some considered learned Roman Catholics, but not exclusively Catholic, that uh, there's a natural law that supersedes and is more important than what we consider the law that the people of America and other nation states have passed. That is the law that you must apply. Well, we've crossed over in this Alabama case because the question there was, well, there were three families who had uh, submitted embryos to these centers. And they had, they actually, uh, the embryos in the process of in vitro fertilization, meaning in a laboratory with ova, plural of ovum, and sperm can fertilize an ovum and then implant it. And that fertilized ovum may progress where the parents themselves 
could not create that instance. And then a child may be born as a result of this process. And there are miscarriages, obviously. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And so there are, well, I don't want to just say several, but there can be more than one individual uh, fecundated ovum. So what is this case in Alabama about? The case in Alabama is about uh, these three families who had these embryos, and then they saved some in a cyrogenic lab that was provided. And in that cyrogenic lab, these frozen uh, uh, fecundated ova were sustained. And one day, a patient came into the area where these ova, ova were and took them out. And the sub-zero temperature that contained these fertilized ova, um, it hurt him. He lost his grip. It fell to the ground. And those ova were lost. That's what the case is about. The case brought by the three families whose ova was in that location. Now, how would you start this case? They started by making it a case that minors had been harmed, M-I-N-O-R-S, and this therefore was invoked and they sued those who held the OVA, in that case, for killing a person because they claimed that the fecundated OVA were persons. Now, this is not without law elsewhere. Law elsewhere says that the ova, for purposes of in vitro fertilization, is property. Now, does that make more sense? And why do they want them to be persons? They want them to be persons so that they can prosecute and contain and overrule and take the freedom from a woman and her uh, domain over her own body and claim she can't because what's in her from the moment of a fecundated ovum is a person. And therefore, a pers the person within, they would claim, had superior rights to the host mother, which is how they have spoken about them before. And the Speaker of the House, as you know, thinks that women, their purpose is to have children. Holy sperm. Don't waste a holy sperm. I can't remember the line from uh, uh, the, the comics, but you get the point. Now, some time ago, I'm alert to this because some time ago, when I was uh, counsel uh, to the House Judiciary Committee, uh, they, there was a proposal by the Republicans that if a pregnant woman was attacked, that the person who did that could be prosecuted for hurting the person within, okay? That is, they wanted to treat the fetus as a person. So they weren't going back to the fecundated ovum, but that's, that's what they were saying, that there was a child. My argument was if you really cared about the abuse to a woman, it shouldn't matter if the miscarriage or sufferance or whatever happens as a result of an assault on a woman it shouldn't matter if what is within is a person or not. And in fact, all medical science says it's not. So if you really care about the woman, instead of making a point to treat something that is a religious myth as reality, uh, then you find another way. And so at the time, among my responsibilities, I suggested the Motherhood Protection Act. And I, I discussed it with Zoe Lofgren, whom I was uh, her chief of staff and her special counsel, I think, at the time this happened. The first time it happened. It's happened several times. They make a run every once in a while to see if they can pass these kinds of things. And so the Motherhood Protection Act worked this way. A woman who is pregnant, and it did not have to be known by the assailant that she was pregnant, who was assaulted and without his knowledge that there was a child that was an enhancement on any criminal prosecution against the person who assaulted her. 
It did not, de it did not depend on whether or not how she was affected involved a person or a fetus or a fecundated ova, ovum. So uh, now I was tasked with talking to the, men, the women's groups uh, about how this was okay to do. And I spent, <laughs> I said I wanted combat pay to Zoe Lofgren because a lot of this conversation happened at a local bar, which was fine. It was, it was open and there was nobody else there. And maybe a few drinks helped keep this on, this task on uh, online, but they were concerned that it be be used and manipulated, and because the Republican bill was going to come to the floor, I wanted to give a way for people who cared about women who were pregnant a means of expression. And Zoe Lofgren, when I recommended it, she agreed, and we wrote up something, and we uh, we ultimate made it the alternative. Then. What happened, we went to the floor and uh, the, uh, the leadership at first was anxious about w what would happen with this bill. And we decided that we would oppose it, but we would not allow this bill to prevail. And so in that sense, this bill that was going nowhere in the Senate or in the White House allowed people to say, we care to protect women who are pregnant, but in ways that don't get us into the debate about is a fetus or a fecundated ovum, ovum a person? And we believe medically they're not. So the, in a microcosm, these things that I'm talking about, what do we do with immigrants? What do we do with lying witnesses who lie about uh, the nature of the nominee I think should be the president, which is Joe Biden? What do we do about things like the post Dobbs world we live in, in which Republicans and those judges on the court appointed by Trump made the overruling of Roe v. Wade possible and now have created this monster that roams the land compromising people in these categories. That is, people who want to get the truth about politics so they can make a judgment when they vote people who are concerned about whether there'll be camps for the deported and maybe others, um, people who are concerned about uh, a woman's right uh, to be let alone, which was the expression in Griswold against Connecticut. So I offer these uh, few words while there's a cold, wet world outside. And uh, I've noticed that I've raised my eyebrow several times, and I, I don't mean to be channeling Rudy Giuliani, because when we were young prosecutors, he had this way of boring into people with his eyes like that. And uh, I suppose on some uh, silent, semi-conscious way, uh, it's my way of mimicking a bad habit he has and a bad person he's become. So I uh, spin around amongst my law books, and I thank you for listening. And tomorrow, if the weather's better, I'll do this from outside. All the best. Bye-bye.